The Happiness Industry by William Davies. This is chapter eight, Critical Animals. And it's the, la the last chapter. It has long been understood that working outdoors has certain psychological and emotional benefits, especially when it involves tending nature. Gardening can prove helpful in alleviating depression and there's evidence to suggest that the presence of foliage directly lifts an individual's mood. When the British Office for National Statistics produced its first official data on national well-being, it concluded that the happiest residents of the UK were those living in remote and beautiful parts of Scotland, while the happiest workers were those managing forests. Some researchers have even suggested that the color green has positive psychological effects. There's a long history of putting mentally troubled people to work on farms. The routines of milking, tilling, and harvesting offer their own form of normality for those who cannot cope with the normality offered in society at large. People who can't seem to find coherence in their own lives can't relate to a conventional job or have suffered some brutal emotional rupture, discover that the presence of plants and animals has a calming influence. The harshness of agricultural life may sometimes be part of its value. Crops fail, weather turns bad, but the only plausible response is to laugh and collectively have another go. Neither individual glory nor individual blame are appropriate, in strong contrast to the ethos of 21st century neoliberalism. In the early 2000s, Baron Aldridge was looking to establish a farm of this sort in Cumbria, in Britain's Lake District. Aldridge had worked on a care farm in America for a year and had experienced working in mental health services in Cumbria. He identified farming as an obvious gap in the forms of mental health provision that were available and set about making the case to the Regional Development Agency and various charitable trusts, funding, or trusts. Funding was agreed and in 2004, Growing Well was established, a 10 acre farm producing vegetables that are sold locally. Volunteers can spend as little as half a day a week working on the farm to help them recover from a variety of mental and emotional difficulties. Judged from the perspective of funders, policymakers, and mental health experts, Growing Well has been a great success. Evaluations have shown that those who spend time working at the farm experience clear improvements in their conditions, which tend to be more sustainable than the improvements offered by medicalized forms of treatment. Initially, most of the people who came to Growing Well had been referred, to, had been referred there by social services and social care practitioners. But with the emergence of social prescribing as a recognized medical practice, Growing Well has also been able to forge relationships with doctors practices around the northwest of England. By 2013, 130 volunteers had spent time working at the farm. How should we make sense of the success of something like Growing Well? If one chooses to view the human mind or brain as something or as some magically autonomous entity with its own strange habits, tastes, fluctuations, and dysfunctions, which we as human beings have to look after with the assistance of managers, doctors, and policymakers, then the story is relatively obvious. People are occasionally victims of a spontaneous mental or neurological affliction, which they are powerless to fix. Perhaps some neuron isn't firing properly. Perhaps a bad mix of hormones has been released into their blood due to stress factors, which they should have avoided. Maybe, maybe they haven't managed their happiness effectively enough through diet, exercise, and empathy towards others. The natural environment and physical activity offer a psychosomatic treatment for these sorts of ailment, not unlike a drug or a talking cure. No doubt this is the story, or no doubt this is the sort of story that many of Growing Well's funders and NHS collaborators would tell. It is certainly the sort of story that has captured the imagination of policymakers and managers today. And in the face of a constant drip drip of neurological and behaviorist research findings into the, main, the mainstream media or via self-help literature, 
It is the sort of story that individuals may now tell about their own lives. My brain has developed a dysfunction which requires a treatment. My mind has started playing up like an errant dog. Spending time with plants becomes a medical fix. After all, as positive psychologists relently, relentlessly remi remind us, well-being is a choice. Someone needs to take my mind or brain in hand. But this is very different from how Baron Aldridge understands the project he founded. As far as he is concerned, growing well is a business, not some form of medical prescription in disguise. Prior to establishing the farm, Aldridge had done a master's degree in vocational rehabil rehabilitation, studying how work helps people recover from illnesses and painful life events. His, dis his dissertation looked at participatory management practices, exploring the benefits of democratic business structures, otherwise known as cooperatives. It struck him that including people in the running of businesses, be they social enterprises or not, was an obvious way of helping them rediscover a sense of purpose and agency in their own lives. Why not bring together the movement for care farming, which had, which had traditionally been viewed as a service to mental health patients, with that of cooperatives, which offered a template for empowering people to organize and produce collectively. Virtually all the scientific analysis of the psychological effects of spending time with plants completely ignores why a person might do so. Gardening and harvesting become merely therapeutic. The relationship between foliage and mood is represented as a simple one of cause and effect. The ethos of growing well is entirely different from this. Its organizing principle is that volunteers share the same purpose of producing and selling good vegetables. The farm is established as an industrial and provident society, one of the legal forms available for the creation of cooperatives in the UK. Anyone who has an interest in growing well, be it, be it as a customer, a volunteer, or a visitor wanting to know more about farming, is encouraged to become a member, who is then able to participate in decision making. Volunteers are offered the opportunity to engage in management of the business, at whatever level of seniority they would like. This isn't just about working with your hands, it is also about expressing a view and taking some control. The agencies funding Growing Well and the doctors referring patients to volunteer there have one theory as to what is going on. Aldridge and his colleagues have another one entirely. According to the former, the volunteers are medically ill and receiving a form of treatment. According to the latter, they are rediscovering their dignity, exercising judgment, and participating in a business which trades successfully in the local area. In the first theory, the volunteers are passive without any medically relevant interpretation of their own, of their situation. In the second theory, they are active in gaining opportunities to influence the world around them through interpreting and debating it. Could it not be that both views are correct? In a superficial sense, it could. People can maintain different ideas of what is going on based on different types of evidence and scientific methodology. The more fundamental question is what it means for society, for politics, or for personal life stories to operate according to certain forms of psychological and neurological explanation. A troubling possibility is that it is precisely the behaviorist and medical view of the mind as some sort of internal bodily organ or instrument which suffers silently, that locks us into the forms of passivity associated with depression and anxiety in the first place. A society designed to measure and manage fluctuations in pleasure and pain, as Bentham envisaged, may be set up for more instances of mental breakdown than one designed to help people speak and participate. Understanding Unhappiness why do people become unhappy and what should anyone do about it? These are questions which concern philosophers, psychologists, politicians, neuroscientists, managers, economists, activists, and doctors alike. How one sets about answering such questions will depend heavily on what sorts of theories and interpretations one employs. A sociologist will offer different types of answers from a neuroscientist 
who will offer different types of answers, again, from a psychoanalyst. The question of how we explain and respond to human unhappiness is ultimately an ethical and political one of where we choose to focus our critique and to be blunt and to be blunt about it, where we intend to level the blame. Baron Aldridge's insight on which the structure and ethos of growing well is based is an important one. Treating the mind or brain as some form of decontextualized independent entity that breaks down by its own accord, requiring monitoring and fixing by experts, is a symptom of the very culture that produces a great deal of unhappiness today. Disempowerment is an integral part of how depression, stress, and anxiety arise. And despite the best efforts of positive psychologists, disempowerment occurs as an effect of social, political, and economic institutions and strategies, not of neural or behavioral errors. To deny this is to exacerbate the problem for which happiness science claims to be the solution. Beyond the various behaviorist and utilitarian disciplines that have been explored in this book, there are a number of research traditions which share this focus on disempowerment. The community psychology tradition, which emerged in the United States during the 1960s, insists that individuals can only be understood within their social contexts. Clinical psychologists have been among the most outspoken critics of the medicalization of distress and the role of the pharmaceutical companies in encouraging it. Allied to a critique of capitalism, these psychologists, such as David Smale and Mark Rapley in the UK, have offered alternative interpretations of psychiatric symptoms based on a more sociological and political understanding of unhappiness. Social epidemiology, as practiced by Carl Muntaner in Canada or Richard Wilkinson in the UK, tries to understand how mental disorders vary across different societies and different social classes, correlating with different socioeconomic conditions. At various, at various points in history, these more sociological approaches even found their way into the thinking of business. As Chapter 3 explored, there was a period during the 1930s and 1940s when market research acquired a quasi-democratic dimension, seeking to discover what the public wanted from and thought about the world. Sociologists, statisticians, and, so and socialists became instrumental to how the attitudes of the public were represented. As chapter, seven, or as chapter 4 discussed, the emphasis which management came to put on teamwork, health, and enthusiasm from the 1930s onwards has occasionally produced more radical analyses, which highlight the importance of collective power and voice in the workplace as contributing factors to productivity and well-being. This potentially points towards whole new models of organization and not simply new techniques of management. At each point in the history of happiness measurement, from the Enlightenment through to the present, hopes for a different social and economic world flicker into view as unhappiness becomes a basis to challenge the status quo. Understanding the strains and pains that work Hierarchy, financial pressures, and inequality place upon human well-being is a first step to challenging those things. This emancipatory spirit flips swiftly into a conservative one once the same body of evidence is used as a basis to judge the behavior and mentality of people rather than the structure of power. Hope is not so much dashed as ensnared. Critique is turned inwards. This is not necessarily how things have to be. Once the critical eye is turned upon institu institutions in a way from the emotion or mood of the individual who inhabits them, things start to look very different indeed. Among wealthy nations, the rate of mental illness correlates very closely to the level of economic inequality across society as a whole. With the United States at the top, 
The nature and availability of work plays a crucial role in influencing mental well-being, as do organizational structures and managerial practices. One of the most important findings in happiness economics is that unemployment exerts a far more negative effect on people psychologically than the mere loss of, er of earnings would suggest. Meanwhile, types of work where individuals have no skill discretion or decision authority have been repeatedly found to trigger the release of cortisol into the brain or into the blood, which leads to hardening of arteries and heightened risk of heart disease. It is scarcely surprising that employee well-being is higher in employee-owned companies where decision-making is more participatory and authority more distributed than in regular shareholder-owned firms. In their extensive analysis of how recessions affect public health, David Stuckler and Sanjay Basu demonstrate the precise ways in which austerity policies have led to deteriorating mental and physical health and unnecessary deaths. They also indicate alternatives in which recessions can be an opportunity for improvements in public health, which route is chosen is ultimately a political question. While economists and policymakers focus only on whether or not an individual has work or not, there is considerable evidence to suggest that the structure and purpose of an organization are crucial to its psychological and physiological effects on employees. For instance, people find work more fulfilling in not-for-profit organizations than in private businesses, leading to lower stress levels. To view work as some contributor to well-being, as policymakers now tend to do without considering the purpose of work, is to fall into the behaviorist fallacy of viewing people as lab rats, just with slightly more developed verbal behavior. Research on advertising and materialist aspiration offers an equally compelling critique. Led by the American psychologist Tim Kasser, a range of studies has looked at how materialist values correlate to happiness and repeatedly tells the same troubling story. Business school students who have strongly internalized materialist values, that is, of measuring their own worth in terms of money, report lower levels of happiness and self-actualization than those who haven't. Individuals who spend their money in obsessive ways, either too cautiously or too loosely, have been discovered to suffer from lower levels of well-being. And materialism and social isolation have been shown to be mutually reinforcing. Lonely people seek material goods more compulsively, while materialist individuals are more at risk of loneliness. Advertising and marketing play a crucial, crucial role in sustaining these negative spirals. Indeed, they and their paymasters have a clear economic interest in doing so. If consumption and materialism remain both cause and effect of indiv individualistic, unhappy cultures, then the vicious circle is a profitable one for those involved in marketing. The precise role of advertising in the propagation of materialist values is disputed, although research does at the very least confirm that the two have risen in tandem with one another. None of the research cited here is especially surprising, and much of it has attracted a great deal of discussion in the mainstream media. What it all ultimately comes down to is the question of how power is distributed in society and in the economy where individuals feel buffeted by forces over which they have no influence, be that managerial discretion, financial insecurity, images of bodily perfection, relentless performance measures, the constant experiments of social media platforms, the diktats of well-being gurus, they will not only find it harder to achieve contentment in their lives, but they will also be at much greater risk of suffering some more drastic breakdown. As... <clears throat> As Muntiner's research has shown, those at the bottom of the income scale are most vulnerable in this respect. Trying to maintain a stable family while income is unpredictable and work is insecure is among the most stressful things a person can do. No politician should be permitted to stand up and talk about mental health or stress without also clarifying where they stand on the issue of economic precariousness 
of the most vulnerable people in society. If we know most of this, why does this critical discourse not achieve more political bite? If we want to live in a way that is socially and psychologically prosperous and not simply highly competitive, lonely, and materialistic, there's a great deal of evidence from clinical psychology, social epidemiology, occupational health, sociology, and community psychology regarding what is currently obstructing this possibility. The problem is that in the long history of scientifically analyzing the relationship between subjective feelings and external circumstances, there's always the tendency to see the former as more easily changeable than the latter. As many positive psychologists now enthusiastically encourage people to do, if you can't change the cause of your distress, try and alter the way you react and feel instead. This is also how critical politics has been neutralized. This is not to say that altering social and economic structures is easy. It is frustrating, unpredictable, and often deeply disappointing. What is hard to deny, however, is that it becomes virtually impossible to do in any legitimate way once institutions and individuals themselves have become so preoccupied by measuring and manipulating individual feelings and choices. If there are to be social and political solutions to the problems which cause misery, then the first step must be to stop viewing those problems in purely psychological terms. And yet the utilitarian and behaviorist divisions of an individual as predictable, malleable, and controllable, so long as there is sufficient surveillance, have not triumphed merely due to the collapse of collectivist alternatives. It has been repeatedly pushed by specific elites for specific political and economic purposes and is experiencing another major political push right now. Scientific tram lines. Since the 1980s, there has been a succession of decades of the brain. George Bush Sr. announced that the 1990s would be the decade of the brain. The European Commission launched its own equivalent decade in 1992. In 2013, the Obama administration announced a new decade-long program of investment in neuroscience. Each of these has ratcheted up the amount of public investment in brain research to an ever higher level. The Obama Brain Initiative, as it is known, is projected to cost $3 billion by the time it has run its course. The European Commission's FP7 research funding round saw nearly two billion pounds invested in neuroscientific projects between 2007 and 2013. The military industrial complex, as President Eisenhower named it in 1961, has been the major driver of the neurosciences in the United States. The Pentagon sees new opportunities to influence enemy combatants and produce more resilient US soldiers. The neuroscientist Paul Zak, whose work has focused on the social and economic importance of oxytocin includes the Pentagon among his various consultancy clients. In that case, the interest is in how US soldiers can behave in ways more likely to win trust from civilians in, in countries they've invaded. Zach offers advice on the neural underpinnings of moral engagement on the ground. That industry is heavily invested in brain research is unsurprising. The pharmaceutical industry has some very obvious incentives to push the boundaries of science in this area, while neuromarketers maintain the hope that the brain's buy button will eventually be identified once and for all. It is then only a question of working out how such a button might be pushed by advertising. The implications of neuroscience for anyone seeking to influence and control people, be they employees, delinquents, soldiers, problem families, addicts, or whatever, are quite obvious, even if they are occasionally exaggerated. Crudely causal explanations of why an individual took decision X as opposed to Y, and how to alter this in future, have a lucrative market among the powerful. The political focus upon the brain as an individual organ may only date back to the early 1990s, but it is in keeping with a much longer standing tradition which has been producing alliances among university researchers, governments, and businesses since the late 19th century. 
It is well known that a great deal of research investment in behavioral science and decision research during the 1950s was driven by military imperatives of the Cold War. The University of Michigan, which has been a leading center of this research since World War II and occupies a central place in the evolution of behavioral economics, is a regular recipient of defense-related research contracts to better understand teamwork and decision-making in combat situations. The science of social contagion to which the 2014 Facebook mood manipulation experiment contributed also has links to U.S. defense interests. The Pentagon's Minerva Research Initiative was launched in 2008 to gather social scientific knowledge on issues and regions of strategic importance to the United States. This included a contract with Cornell University to investigate how civil unrest spreads as a social contagion. One of the recipients of Minerva funding at Cornell was communications professor Jeffrey Hancock, who was also one of the researchers in the Facebook study. This is not to imply guilt by association, but simply to point out that certain types of knowledge are useful to certain types of agency with particular strategic interests. Pop behaviorism offering to reveal the secrets of social influence has become a booming area of nonfiction publishing, making minor celebrities of psychologists such as Dan Arilli and Robert Caldini, and behavioral economists such as Richard Thaler. Speaking fees for these academics range between $50,000 to $75,000 a day. A day! giving an indication of the types of network that their, knowledgeable, their knowledge is fed into. The circuit of behavioral expertise feeds directly into the marketing and advertising, advertising industries, as it has done pretty much ever since the American visitors to Willem Wundt's laboratory returned home at the end of the 19th century. Few of these examples are concerned with happiness or well-being as such although neuroscientists now profess to see emotions, affect, depression, and happiness as embodied and behavioral phenomena. In that respect, happiness is being finally emptied of its subjective dimension once and for all and becoming rendered an objective behavioral event to be inspected by experts. Whether or not the concern is explicitly benthamite in the sense of maximizing a positive emotion within the individual what all of these traditions share is a certain political co-option of psychological science in which human activities and feelings are studied so as to better understand how they might be predicted and controlled. Utilitarian, biological, and behaviorist representations of human life have acquired a near monopoly on plausibility in the West today, but this is because the greatest sources of power and wealth in human history have been mobilized towards ensuring that this is the case. We might well describe this as ideology, but to bracket it in this way is to risk ignoring the ways in which a certain vision of individual freedom is theorized, developed, sustained, and enforced thanks to extensive technological and institutional apparatuses. This does not occur simply in some ghostly way thanks to the market or capitalism or neoliberalism. It requires a lot of work, power, and money in order to be as successful as it is. The greatest successes of behavioral and happiness science occur when individuals come to interpret and narrate their own lives according to this body of expertise. As lay people, we come to attribute our failures and sadness to our brains or our troublesome minds. Operating with constantly split personalities, we train ourselves to be more suspicious of our thoughts or more tolerant of our feelings with the encouragement of cognitive behavioral therapy in ways that will baffle cultural historians a century from now we even engage in quantified self-monitoring of our own accord volunteering information on our behaviors nutrition and mood to databases maybe out of sheer desperation to be part of something larger than just ourselves just ourselves once we are split down the middle in this way a relationship perhaps a friendship with oneself becomes possible, which when taken it too literally breeds lonely, loneliness and or narcissism. Mystical seductions. 
What would an escape from this hard psychological science look like if politics and organization have been excessively psycho psychologized, reducing every social and economic problem to one of incentives, behavior, happiness, and the brain? What would it take for them to be de-psychologized? One answer is a constant temptation, but we should be wary of it. This is to flip the harsh, rationalist, objective science of the mind and brain into its opposite, namely a romantic, subjective reveling in the mysteries of consciousness, freedom, and sensation. Confronted by a social world that has been reduced to quasi-mechanical natural forces of cause and effect, the lure of mysticism grows all the greater. In the face of the radical objectivism of neuroscience and behaviorism, which purport to render every inner feeling visible to the outside world, there is a commensurate appeal in radical subjectivism, which claims that what really matters is entirely private to the individual concerned. The problem is that these two philosophies are entirely compatible with one another. There is no friction between them, let alone conflict. This is a case of what Gustav Fechner described as psycho physical parallelism. For evidence of this, see how the promotion of mindfulness in many versions of positive psychology slips seamlessly between offering scientific facts about what our brains or minds are doing and quasi-Buddhist injunctions to simply sit, be, and notice events as they flow in and out of the consciousness. The limitation of the behavioral and neurosciences is that, while they purport to ignore objective aspects of human freedom, they speak a language which is primarily meaningful to expert researchers in universities, governments, and businesses. By focusing on whatever can be rendered objective, they leave a gap for a more subjective and passive discourse. New Age mysticism plugs this gap. Many happiness advocates such as Richard Laird work on both fronts simultaneously. They analyze official statistics, draw on the lessons of neuroscience, mine data and trace behaviors to produce their own objective view of what makes people happy. And then they push for new secular religions, meditation practices and mindfulness, which will provide the narrative through which the non-scientist can master his own well-being. The result is that the powerful and the powerless are speaking different languages, with the, latters, with the latters consequently incapable of troubling the formers. Nothing like a public denunciation or critique of the powerful is possible under these conditions. The language and theories of expert elites are becoming more idiosyncratic and separate from those of the public. How they narrate human life and how we do so are pulling apart from each other, which undermines the very possibility of inclusive political deliberation. For example, positive psychology stresses that we should all stop comparing ourselves to each other and focus on feeling more grateful and empathetic instead. But isn't comparison precisely what happiness measurement is there to achieve? Doesn't giving one person a seven and another person a six work so as to render their differences comparable? The morality that is being offered by way of therapy is often entirely insulated from the logic of the science and technologies which underpin it. This problem is exacerbated in the age of ubiquitous digital tracking and the big data that results. In his book, Info Infoglut, the critical media theorist Mark Andre Andrzejewicz looks at how the phenomenon of excessive information requires and facilitates new ways of navigating knowledge. But as he shows, these have extreme forms of inequality built into them. There are those who possess the power of algorithmic analysis and data mining to navigate a world in which there are too many pieces of data to be studied individually. These include market research agencies, social media platforms, and the security services. But for the rest of us, impulse and emotion have become how we orientate and simplify our decisions. Hence the importance of fMRI and sentiment analysis in the digital age. Tools which visualize, measure, and codify our feelings become the main conduit between an esoteric expert discourse of mathematics and facts 
and a layperson's discourse of mood, mystical belief, and feeling. We simply feel our way around while they observe and algorithmically analyze the results. Two separate languages are at work. The terminal dystopia of Benthamism, as touched on in Chapter 7, is of a social world that has been rendered totally objective, to the point where the distinction between the objective and the subjective is overcome. Once happiness is understood completely, the scientist will know where and when it takes place, regardless of the person supposedly experiencing it. The need to learn from the verbal behavior of the person being studied will be eliminated once and for all by the by sophisticated forms of mind reading. Our faces, eyes, body movements, and brains will communicate our pleasures and pains on our behalf, freeing decision makers from the tyranny of sounds. This may be an exaggeration of any feasible political society, but it represents an animating ideal for how particular traditions of psychological and political science progress. Mysticism may provide private philosophical succor in such a society, but also a final political quietism. I know how you feel. Witnessing someone else's brain light up is something that costs a lot of money. A state-of-the-art fMRI scanner costs $1 million, with annual operating costs of between $100,000 and $300,000. The insights that such technologies offer into mental illness, brain defects, and injuries are considerable. Gradually, our everyday language of moods, choices, and tastes is being translated into terms that correspond to different physical parts of our brains. Neural marketers can now specify that one, one advertisement causes activity in a given part of the brain, while a different advertisement does not. This is believed to have significant commercial implications, but to what extent does so much technological progress aid us in a more fundamental problem of social life, that of understanding other people? When Bentham wrote that nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure, and declared that these entities were potentially measurable, he affirmed a certain philosophical approach in which the questions of psychology were not significantly different from those of the natural sciences. Indeed, psychology and politics would become truly scientific once it was grounded in matters as natural and objective as biology or chemistry. By the same token, human beings have nothing to distinguish them from other animals, other than their particular biological features. All animals suffer and humans are no different. In various ways, many of the characters explored over the course of this book have shared this philosophical prejudice. Our concepts have been shaped accordingly. Our notions of behavior, stress, and learned helplessness all originate with animal experiments using rats, pigeons, and dogs. But what if this philosophy is grounded in a mistake? And what if it is a mistake that we keep on making, no matter how advanced our brain scanning mind measuring and facial reading devices become in fact what if we actually become more liable to make this mistake as our technology grows more sophisticated for ludwig wittgenstein and those who have followed him a statement such as bentham's about our two sovereign masters is based upon a fundamental mis misunderstanding of the nature of psychological language to rediscover a different notion of politics we might first have to excavate a different way of understanding the feelings and behaviors of others. To understand what a word means, Wittgenstein argued, is to understand how it is used, meaning that the problem of understanding other people is first and foremost a social one. Equally, to understand what another person is doing is to understand what their actions mean, both for them and for others who are involved. If I ask the question, what is that person feeling? I can answer my interpret by I can answer by interpreting their behavior or by asking them. The answer is not inside their head or body to be discovered, but lies in how the two of us interact. There's nothing stopping me from being broadly right about what they are feeling, so long as that is recognized as an interpretation of what they are doing and communicating or what their behavior means. 
I am not going to discover what they are feeling as some sort of fact in the way that I can discover their body temperature, nor would they be reporting a fact should they tell me that they're thinking or what they're thinking. This points towards the unusual quality of psychological language, and neuroscientists and behaviorists repeatedly tie themselves in knots over precisely this. To understand a psychological term such as happiness, mood, or motivation is to understand it both in terms of how it appears in others, that is, as behavior, and in terms of how it occurs in oneself, that is, as an experience. I know what happiness means because I know how to describe it in others and to notice it in my own life. But this is an unusual type of language if one ever believes that happiness refers to an objective thing, be it inside you or inside me, I have misunderstood the word. Psychological attributes, Wittgenstein argued, are attributes of the animal as a whole. It is nonsense to say that my knee wants to go for a walk because only a human being can want something. But due to the hubris of scientific psychology and neuroscience, it has become a commonplace to say, for example, your mind wants you to buy this product, or my brain keeps forgetting things. When we do this, we forget that wanting and forgetting are actions which only make sense on the basis of an interpretation of human beings embedded in social relations with intentions and purposes. Behaviorism seeks to exclude all, all of that, but in the process does considerable violence to the language we use to understand other people. Psychology is afflicted by the same error time and time again of being modeled on physiology or biology, either by force of metaphor or by more literal reductionism. Of course, this attempt to either reduce psychology to the physical or at least base it on mechanical or biological metaphors is one of the main strategies of power and control offered by the various theorists explored over the course of this book. For Jevons, the mind was best understood as a mechanical balancing device. For Watson, it was nothing but observable behavior. For Selly, it could be discovered in the body. For Marino, it was manifest in measurable social networks. Marketers now like to attribute our decisions and moods to our brains, and so on. And yet we needn't and mustn't return to the dualism of Fechner or Wundt either. To assert the subjective trans transcend transcendent, intangible nature of the mind in opposition to the physical body is to keep flipping the same dualism on its head, like preaching a mindfulness doctrine that is one half neuroscience and the other half Buddhism. To return to a vision of the mental realm as entirely private and invisible to the outside world is to remain trapped in a state of affairs where we keep asking ourselves neurotic and paranoid questions, such as, what am I really feeling? Or I wonder if he's truly happy. It is in this sort of confused philosophical territory that the owner of the brain scanner can promise to resolve all moral and political questions once and for all. At its most fundamental, the choice between Bentham and Wittgenstein is a question of what it means to be human. Bentham posited the human condition as one of mute physical pain to be, ex to be expertly relieved through carefully designed interventions. This is an ethic of empathy, which is extrapolated to a society of scientific surveillance. It also views the division between humans and animals as philosophically insignificant. For Wittgenstein, by contrast, there is nothing prior to language. Humans are animals which speak, and their language is one that other humans understand. Pleasure and pain lose their privileged position and cannot, and cannot be treated as matters of scientific fact. You learned the concept pain when you learned language. But it is fruitless to search for some reality of consciousness outside of the words we have to express ourselves. If people are qualified to speak for themselves, the constant need to anticipate or to try and measure how they are feeling suddenly disappears. So potentially does the need for ubiquitous psychosomatic surveillance technologies. How else to know people? Psychology and social science are perfectly possible under the sorts of conditions described by Wittgenstein. Indeed, they are much more straightforward. 
Systematic efforts to understand other people through their behavior and speech are entirely worthwhile, but they are not so different from the forms of understanding that we all make of one another in everyday life. As the social psychologist Ram Hare argues, we all face the occasional problem of not being sure what other people mean or intend, but have ways of overcoming this. The only possible solution, he argues, is to use our understanding of ourselves as the basis for the understanding of others, and our understanding of others of our species to further our understanding of ourselves. One implication of this when it comes to acquiring psychological knowledge is that we have to take what people say far more seriously. Not only that, but we have to assume that for the most part they meant what they said unless we can identify some reason why they didn't. Where behaviorism always attempts to get around people's reports of what they're feeling in search of the underlying emotional reality, an interpretative social psychology insists that feeling and speaking cannot be ultimately disentangled from each other. Part of what it means to understand the feelings of another is to hear and understand what they mean when they use the word feeling. Techniques such as surveys may have a valuable role to play in fostering mutual understanding across large and diverse societies. But again, there is too much misunderstanding as to what is going on when a survey takes place. Surveys can never be instruments which represent some set of quasi-natural objective facts. Rather, they are useful and interesting ways of engaging with people, probing them for answers. As the critical psychologist John Crombie has argued with respect to happiness surveys, happiness does not exert a, a determinate force that always makes all human participants tick the boxes on a scale in a particular way. There is not the law-like relation between happiness and questionnaire response that exists between, say, the volume of a quantity of mercury and its temperature. This doesn't mean that a happiness survey doesn't communicate anything, but what it conveys cannot be disentangled from the social interaction between the surveyor and the surveyed. The ideal of discovering something more objective than this, through stripping out the self-awareness of the respondent, for instance, analyzing Twitter sentiment instead, is a chimera. It also involves forms of trickery and, and manipulation, which open up a breach between between the researcher and everybody else. Another way of understanding this argument is that psychology, clearly understood, is a door through which we pass in the way to political dialogue. This is in contrast to the Benthamite and behaviorist traditions explored in this book, which view psychology as a step towards physiology and or economics, precisely so as to shut the door on politics. Unless something goes wrong, the core questions of psychology are relatively simple. What is that person doing? What is that person feeling right now? For the most part, the answers to these questions are relatively unproblematic, and the first and most important methodology for answering them is one that we all use every day. Just ask them. That this methodology is not taken more seriously by managerial elites is scarcely surprising. It requires processes of, del of deliberation. It credits people with their own legitimate interpretations and critiques of their own circumstances. It also requires skills to listen, which become submerged in societies that have privileged the power to observe and visualize. Management and government are more secure with the notion of brains lighting up or thinking being no less observable than baseball than they are with the prospect of people intentionally expressing their emotions and judgments. For various reasons, making our minds visible seems safer than making them audible. Entire organizational structures would need to change if the behaviorist vision of an automated silent mind were abandoned in favor of an intelligent speaking one. In a society organized around objective psychological measurement, the power to listen is a potentially iconoclastic one. There is something radical about privileging the sensory power of the ear in a political system designed around that of the eye. 
The clinical psychologist Richard Bentel argues that even quite severe forms of mental illness, which are routinely treated with drugs in the West today, can be alleviated through a patient careful form of engagement with the sufferer and their life history. He suggests that if psychiatric services are to become more genuinely, genuinely therapeutic, and if they are to help people rather than merely manage their difficulties, it will be necessary to rediscover the art of relating to patients with warmth, kindness, and empathy. Listening and talking will not cure them because they are not treatments in the first place. But behind the symptoms of psychosis and schizophrenia, there are stories and emotional injuries which only a good listener will discover. The, the rediscovery of listening is a priority that permeates other fields of social science. The sociologist Les Back argues that listening to the world is not an automatic faculty, but a skill that needs to be trained. Noting it is this which gets lost in a society of abstracted and intrusive empiricism of endless data, exposés, facts, and figures. To know others is to engage with their stories and how they tell them. In the past, critiques of ideology have proposed that most people labor under a false consciousness, not knowing what their real interests are. There is a certain irony in the age of nudges and clandestine Facebook experiments that it may now be more radical to highlight precisely the ways in which ordinary people do know what they're doing, can make sense of their lives, are clear about their interests. For this, researchers need to learn some humility. Among all of this, one of the most important human capacities rediscovered by the sociological psychologist is the ability of the speaker to offer a critical judgment. To describe a critique or a complaint as a form of unhappiness or displeasure is to bluntly misunderstand what those terms mean or what it means to experience and exercise them. Critique will not show up in the brain, which is not to say that nothing happens at a neurological level when we exercise critical judgment. The attempt to drag all forms of, neg of negativity under a single neural or mental definition of unhappiness, often classed as depression, is perhaps the most pernicious of the political consequences of utilitarianism generally. If we understand concepts such as critique and complaint properly, we will recognize that they involve a particular form of negative orientation towards the world that both the critic herself and her audience are aware of. As Hare puts it, to complain verbally is a part of being discontented, because part of what is ascribed to a person who is described as discontented is a tendency to complain. Notions such as critique and complaint mean nothing without also appreciating that people have the unique power to interpret and narrate their own lives. Where the sentiment analyst mining reams of Twitter data is looking for evidence of psychological emotion which people have emitted by accident, to listen to someone explain the rights and wrongs of his own life is to grant him the human dignity of both understanding and articulation. Recognizing that people get angry, critical, resistant, and frustrated is to understand that they have reasons to feel or act in these ways. People express themselves in different ways and with different levels of confidence, but there are good reasons to accept the narratives that people offer about their own lives. If someone is invited to express her feeling, rather than instructed to correctly name or quant quantify it, she makes it into a social phenomenon. Once people are critical or angry, they can also be critical or angry about something which is external to themselves. Whether or not they are considered an articulate or expert person is scarcely relevant. This is already a less lonely, less depressive, less narcissistic state of affairs than one in which people wonder how their minds or brains are behaving and what they should do to improve them. Against psychological control. Imagine if just a small proportion of the political will and financial capital that pushes the behaviorist and happiness agendas were diverted elsewhere. What if just a chunk of the tens of billions of dollars that are currently spent monitoring, predicting, treating, visualizing, anticipating the smallest vagaries of our minds, feelings, and brains 
were spent instead on designing and implementing alternative forms of political economic organization. The laughter which this would no doubt be met with in the higher echelons of business, university management, and government is a sign of how politically important the techniques of psychological control have now become. Would an enlightened mental health practitioner or social epi epidemiologist find it equally funny? I suspect not. Many psychiatrists and clinical psychologists are entirely aware that the problems they are paid to deal with do not start within the mind or body of a solitary individual or even necessarily within the family. They start with some broader social, political, or economic breakdown. Delimiting psychology and psychiatry within the realms of medicine or some quasi-economic behavioral science is a way of neutering the critical potential of these professions. But what would, but what would they and we demand given the chance? The demand that misery be demedicalized in explicit opposition to the interests of the pharmaceutical industry and its representatives within the American Psychiatric Association is one that is gathering momentum. Even, Roberts, even Robert Spitzer, the chief architect of the DSM-3 in 1980, has argued that the extension of medical diagnosis to ordinary, ordinary everyday troubles has now gone too far. The phenomenon of social prescribing is one of the possible borderlands between medicalization and efforts to build alternative social and economic institutions. This could of course go either way, while it could mean seeking different models of social and economic cooperation for mutual benefit, it can also unleash even greater medicalization of social relations, where both work and leisure are evaluated. in terms of their private physiological or neurological utility. Businesses which are organized around a principle of dialogue and cooperative control would be another starting point for a critical mind turned outwards upon the world and not inwards upon itself. One of the advantages of employee-owned businesses is that they are far less reliant on the forms of psychological control that managers of corporations have relied on since the 1920s. There's no need for somewhat ironic HR rhetoric about the staff being the number one asset in firms where that is constant or where that is constitutionally recognized. It is only under conditions of ownership and management which render most people expendable that so much soft rhetorical effort has to be undertaken to reassure them that they are not. Any faintly realistic account of organizations must recognize that there is an optimal amount of dialogue and consultation between zero at one end, the Frederick Taylor position, and constant deliberation. Arguing for democratic business structures cannot plausibly mean the democratization of every single decision at every moment in time, but it is not clear that the case for management autarky, autarky still works either, even on its own terms. If the argument for hierarchies is that they are efficient, that they cut costs, that they get things done, a more nuanced reading of much of the research on unhappiness, stress, depression, and absence in the workplace would suggest that current organizational structures are failing even in this limited aim. If unhappiness is costing the US economy half a trillion a year in lost productivity and lost tax receipts, as Gallup calculates, who is to say that on the spectrum between Taylor and constant deliberation, the economically optimal amount of cooperation and dialogue in the workplace isn't considerably closer to the latter of those two poles. Consultation or dialogue which is purely there to make employees feel valued is useless and repeats the same error yet again. The goal is not to make employees feel valued, but to rearrange power relations such that they are valued, a state of affairs that will most likely influence how they feel as a side effect. Organizational structures which privilege deliberation are very difficult to get right, but this is largely due to lack of practice, professional advice, and experimentation. Writing in 1961, the cultural critic Raymond Williams suggested that the practice of democratic dialogue was something people may need help learning so it could be imported into the management of businesses and local communities. 
This is the real power of institutions, he wrote, that they actively teach particular ways of feeling, and it is at once evident that we have not nearly enough institutions which practically teach democracy. Examples of successful cooperatives confirm the truth in Williams's insight. Over time, members become more skilled in deliberating about the collect collective and less likely to use democratic structures as a vent for their private, private grievances and unhappiness. But they need to be supported in this learning curve. It is a telling indicator of how our political culture has changed in the past half century that the contemporary equivalent of Williams's suggestion is that we teach resilience and mindfulness silent relationships to the self rather than vocal relationships to each other. Stress can be viewed as a medical problem or it can be viewed as a political one. Those who have studied it in its broader social context are well aware that it arises in circumstances where individuals have lost control over their working lives, which ought to throw the policy spotlight on precarious work in autarkic management, not on physical bodies or medical therapies. In 2014, John Ashton, the president of the UK Faculty of Public Health, argued that Britain should gradually move towards a four-day week to alleviate the combined problems of overwork and underwork, both of which are stress factors. At the frontier of utilitarian measurement and management today is a gradual, gradual joining up of economics and medicine into a single science of well-being, accompanied by a monistic fantasy of a single measure of human optimality. Measurements which target the body are becoming commensurable with those geared towards productivity and profit. This is an important area of critique and of resistance. As a point of principle, we might state that the pursuit of health and the, and the pursuit of money should remain in entirely separate evaluative spheres. Extrapolating from this principle yields various paths of action, from the defense of public health care to opposition to workplace well-being surveillance, to rejection of apps and devices which seek to translate fitness behaviors into monetary rewards. Markets are not necessarily the problem. Indeed, they can be part of an escape from pervasive psychological control. Eh. Traditional paid work has a transparency around it, which makes additional psycho psychological and somatic management unnecessary. In contrast, work fair and internship arrangements, which are offered as ways of making people feel more optimistic or raising their self-esteem, replace exchange with further psychological control, often coupled, coupled to barely concealed exploitation. As Chapter 5 argued, neo neoliberalism's respect for free markets has, in any case, always been exaggerated. Marketing, which seeks to reduce business uncertainty, has long been far more attractive to corporations than markets. Suspicion of services offered for free, such as most social media platforms, is a symptom of a more general anxiety regarding technologies of psychological control, which is not simply reducible to traditional concerns about privacy. Advertising is among the most powerful techniques of mass behavioral manipulation, since it first became scientific at the dawn of the 20th century. On this issue, advertisers have a vested interest in contradicting themselves. The customer is sovereign and cannot be conned. The advertisement is simply a vehicle for the product. On the other hand, spending on advertising continues to rise and efforts to inhibit the power of brands and marketing agencies to flood the media, public space, oops, public space, sports, and public institutions with imagery are vigorously attacked. If advertising is so innocent, then why is there so much of it around? Campaigns for advertising free spaces against visual pollution have had a few notable successes in various cities around the world. The Brazilian city of Sao Paulo has no public billboards following the clean city law introduced by the mayor in 2006. Other Brazilian cities have explored similar measures to reduce or ban the amount of advertising. Other campaigns have been more narrowly focused. In 2007, advertisements for luxury accommodation were removed in Beijing. 
the mayor explained that they use exaggerated terms that encourage luxury and self-indulgence which are beyond the reach of low-income groups and are therefore not conducive to harmony in the capital. A U.S. organization, Commercial Alert, runs an annual Ad Slam contest in which $5,000 is awarded to the school that has removed the most advertising from its common spaces. Campaigns such as these are inevitably dependent on some quite traditional ideas of how to defend the public and target some relatively old-fashioned techniques of psychological control. Product placement in free media and entertainment content is a different type of problem altogether. While the internet enables marketing to monitor and target individuals in a far more subtle and individualized fashion. Smart infrastructures, which offer constant feedback loops between individuals and centralized data stores, are assumed to be the future of everything from advertising to healthcare to urban governance to human resource management. The all-encompassing laboratory explored in Chapter 7 is a frightening prospect, not least because it is difficult to see how it might ever be reversed should that be desired in future. But there's no reason to assume that practices such as facial scanning in public spaces or public places must remain legal. What would the critique of smartness look like? And what would resistance to it mean? Would it be a celebration of dumbness? Would we simply refuse to wear the health tracking wristbands? Perhaps. Some aspects of the Benthamite utopia can seem almost impossible to duck out of. The sentiment analyzer who discovers the happiest neighborhood in the city through mining the geodata of tweets, the, instru the instructions from one's doctor to exercise more gratitude so as to improve both mood and reduce physical stress. But remembering the philosophical contradictions inherent in these ventures and their historical and political origins, may at least offer a source of something which has no simple bodily or neural correlate and involves a strange tinge of happiness in spite of unhappiness, hope.